Well, and uh, hello here today with Emil, who's on our staff. And um, yeah, hi. Um, um, I don't know if Emil's going to say on camera or not, but um, Emil will be doing some of the back end stuff, and you get to like say hello. So um, thanks everybody for for being here, and we're excited for the four part series. Um, and let me share my screen so that we can get cruising. Um, is everybody able to see um, the screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay. a second. Great. Thanks. Um, there we go. Um, so it, it's funny that Zoom always continues to change things back to what it was beforehand instead of like what you just set it up as. So hi, everybody. Um, so today we're going to have like a really kind of 101 uh, ish session, um, and we'll build from today through um, the next uh, three additional sessions. So I'm, I'm happy to get us rolling today with some, some just core information that we can, can work from. So our agenda is really pretty simple. Um, we're gonna start with some quick 101 reminders, some statistics about prevalence and what's kind of going on for LGBT folks, really, really basic stuff. We'll then look at social determinants of health and minority stress and microaggressions and adverse childhood experiences. Um, again, really summary overview of those concepts. We'll then move and talk about LGBT specific tactics that can be used within sexual assault um, interactions, um, uh, victimization. And then we'll look at concerns and barriers that both LGBTQ folks have as well as uh, victim service providers or advocates have. And then we'll end with some things that you can do. So if you've been on a Forge training before, you have seen um, pink haired person. Um, I recently saw a, a newer picture of pink haired person um, who has gotten much more gray and it's, um, I may have to get permission to use another, uh, another photo to more accurately represent uh, this person. But do please uh, take care of yourself today. I know that you're encouraged to be here. Um, I heard that it was recorded. So if you need to step away and listen to the recording afterwards, um, please do what you need to do for yourself. Um, like Kelsey said, I am Michael Munson. I'm Forge's executive director. I've been around the block uh, with Forge for uh, 28 years. So I've been around from the beginning. Um, and let me just tell you a little bit about who Forge is so that you've got a, a rough idea of who you're going to be spending time with today and um, over the next few weeks. So Forge is a 28-year-old trans anti-violence organization. We are national in our, our spread. We have some services that are here in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where I am, but fewer and fewer and fewer that are here um, in Milwaukee. We predominantly provide training and technical assistance to victim service providers and other allied professionals. And about 25% of our time we spend directly with trans survivors, non-binary survivors, and loved ones. Because we're national, that means that almost all of that is virtual in, in terms of how we engage with folks. Um, and let me share a little bit about what each of those components are for training and then for direct services. So we offer the typical variety of training and technical assistance. So one-on-one -on -one support. So y'all have a question, you call one of us or you email us and we respond and we engage with um, you know one-on-one -on -one dialogue to try to help figure out um, a better solution to what's going on for you. We have a bunch of publications on our website, um, and that's always expanding. We have a bunch of trainings that are on our website. We love to do trainings with other organizations. Um, just, I think last week um, it was, I've, I've now trained in all 50 states as well as a few of the territories. So like, it's really exciting to be with you all in, um, in another state from, from here in Wisconsin. We are thrilled to be able to go back to conferences again in person and um, share knowledge that way. And again, we do webinars and site visits and work on policy, both for other organizations as well as on national policy issues, um, especially these days where things are a little bit tough for trans folks in particular. Um, we love co collaborating with folks and we try to make sure that people have connections to information and referrals to folks in their communities um, if and when they need them. For survivors, again, this is the smallest part of our work. Um, all of it's online. Um, we able to do many of the same kinds of things. Um, and again, we're really happy to be able to go to conferences again in person, um, slowly and gradually as, as COVID is abating some. Um, so that's kind of the rough idea of what, what we do as an organization. I know it didn't tell you a whole lot, but that's kind of the, the snapshot. We do have a really small staff. Um, we're growing. Emil is um, new as of March. So um, I think Emil's going to have a new person status for maybe another month. And then, you know, then there'll be like 
I don't know, regular and on the team and, and ready to go. Um, and we have somebody new starting in July. So small but mighty large vision um, to, to do this work. Two of the guiding principles that I always want to make sure that we share before we start doing content-based things are we have a framework of, of maintaining um, trauma-informed practices, and that's both true for when we work with survivors, which many of you, you know, also do, but we also care about being trauma-informed when we work with advocates and providers. Um, we want to make sure that we don't do things that are going to be um, unintentionally harmful um, to you all in a training setting. And the same is true for being empowerment-based. A lot of times we think about that with the work that we do with survivors, but I care a lot about making sure that you all feel empowered. So when you leave today, if you're feeling down about yourself, I didn't do my job. So I want you all to feel invigorated and that you're learning new things, or if you're not learning new things, that at least you weren't feeling bad about what was happening. So all of that though is taken into this, um, under this lens of being culturally responsive. We know that communities are all different geographically, identity-wise, experience-wise, and we want to make sure that we at Forge want to make sure that we are trauma-informed and empowerment-based in ways that are culturally responsive and culturally appropriate. All right, a few pieces of housekeeping. Um, you've already done your sign-in. You've already done the assessment. Um, we are going to interact in three different ways today. So the one way is through Poll Everywhere, and I do see that some folks are, are sharing a space so you can interact with your phone as well as a computer. So feel free to have those phone or computer ready because we'll use those a couple of times today. The other way we'll interact is through chat. So, um, and you can interact with chat even when we're doing poll everywhere. So feel free to um, use the chat as we move along today as well. Let us practice the chat. I know that we are all pros at this because of COVID, we were good at Zoom. Could you all share your um, name and a pronoun that you would like folks to use today in the chat? And for those of you who are in a, in a group of three, you can pick which person you want to pick and um, however you want to participate is cool. So share your name and your pronoun. Thank you. Excellent. See, we are all so good at this. Excellent. Thank you. Perfect. So y'all know how to access the chat. Y'all know how to share your pronouns and your name. Perfect for both of those things. And the third way we're going to interact today is through a shared Google Doc. Um, hopefully this will work. Um, I always worry that things are not going to work, but we will figure it out. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And we'll find another way to explore. So I promised um, in the description that we would have survivor quotes. And um, because of the way the world is right now, um, I opted to include some quotes today that are um, about trans joy or trans hope. So they're not the hard things about the barriers that people are experiencing, but they're the, the things that bring trans folks joy or peace or hope in the world. And Emil's gonna be um, helping out with reading some of these quotes as we, we go today. What gives me hope for the future is that we get to experience glimpses or moments of this future we're all building and working towards together, where all trans folks are safe, cared for, and valued. And that's from Sean Hayes. Great. Thank you. And just as a side note, Sean Hayes is up in um, the Minnesota area and is having a weekend of trans joy. It's like a pride fest, but it's about trans joy. So um, it's kind of cool um, that they're kind of bringing that theme to life in person. So we'll set the stage with some really quick things. Um, for some of you, this may be like really, really like old news. You've, you've done this, you've gone there. So just tune out for a few minutes and um, we'll get to the good stuff in, in a few minutes. So um, there's a handout called the Gender Unicorn. Um, it's a really, really basic and simple handout, which um, I love to use as just a, a, a starter to make sure that we all have similar information in our heads. So I'm just gonna quickly go through kind of these four quadrants and the handout is much better and goes into much more detail, but just a reminder for us all that we all have a gender identity and that's what's on the inside. It's what is in our hearts, it's in our minds, it's, it's in our kind of our bodies. It's what we know ourselves to be in terms of gender. And that's really different than what our gender expression is. So our gender expression is what we put out in the world. It's how we dress in the morning, how we comb our hair, if we use jewelry or not, all of those things that give a gendered presentation or a non-gendered presentation um, to the world. 
And again, we all have a gender presentation, whether we're conscious of it or not, whether we pay attention to what we're doing or not out in the world. Those two things are on the left side of the screen. On the right side of the screen is our sexual or romantic um, orientation or attraction. So it's it's literally who we are, you know, who we love, who we care for, um, who turns our head. Um, it's who we're attracted to. And so those things are really different than our gender identity or gender expression. Fourth box is sex assigned at birth. So, um, you know, I always try to not be too graphic here, but, you know, in our culture, the way we do sex assigned at birth is we look between the baby's legs and go, it's a boy or it's a girl. So we oftentimes don't chromosome test. We don't do anything else other than make a visual assessment of if it's a boy or a girl. And a lot of times that's not right. Um, it's not a boy, it's not a girl. Um, it may not be one of those two options. So all four of those things interact and relate together, but they're all separate concepts. And I'm just gonna leave it as that. We could talk about that a lot if folks needed to, but we're gonna move on to um, a little bit more detailed information about sexual violence and um, other forms of the statistics. So again, this is really pretty basic, but when we look at just kind of how many people are lesbian, gay, bi in the world, and I'll, we'll talk about trans folks in a second, about 9% of the population in our country is lesbian, gay, or bi. You can see that the biggest piece of the pie in this one are folks that are bisexual. Um, so it's not an equally divided pie in quarters or anything like that. Most folks um, in that pie of 9% are identifying as bisexual. You could look at lots of different surveys. Sometimes people say that the population is only 3% instead of 9%. There's a fair amount of people that are walking around in this world who are lesbian, gay, or bi. What that means for the folks in Connecticut is that if we look at your whole state's population of, of a little bit over 3,000 folks, it means that 9% is around 324,000 lesbian, gay, and bi folks in the state. So that's a, that's a substantial number of folks. When we move on and look at trans folks, um, the prevalence rate is somewhere around 1%. We can um, look at some of the Williams Institute research, which is less than that, up to Lynn Conway and others who are say it's around 1%. And that percentage is growing and growing. And we'll talk about that in just a second. Again, I want you to show to look at this pie, which kind of breaks down the 1% into different kind of gendered vectors. So this was from the US Trans Survey in 2015, 2016. And you can see that you know, roughly a third of folks identify as trans men, roughly a third identifies trans women, but the plurality, the biggest piece of the pie by just a little bit, are non-binary folks. So it's really important for us to think about that when we're working in sexual assault fields where a lot of times we still have sex segregated services. So if we have a group, a support group for women, it's not gonna fit for a lot of trans men, for a lot of trans women, it's definitely not gonna fit for non-binary folks who don't identify with male or female. So just kind of keeping a pin in that reality that non-binary folks are gonna have a really hard time accessing some services if they're sex specific or sex segregated. And we all hope that um, you're moving away from those models if you haven't already moved into a more integrated model. Like I said, that 1% of folks that are trans is growing. Um, our youth are deciding that the world is not so simple. It's not as old as it used to be with, let's only have these two options. And the young folks, so young folks being 18 to 29 years old and even younger than that, are um, really leaning towards non-binary identities or genderqueer identities or gender identities that are not in that binary role. So you can see on this slide, it's a little bit complicated the way it's presented, but around 5% of youth or young adults, um, 18 to 29, are identifying as trans or non-binary. So again, if we look at the state of Connecticut and we look at 1% of the population, that's around 36,000 trans people who are walking about in Connecticut on any particular day. Um, these are reminders that y'all don't need to, to be reminded of, but Trans people, lesbian, gay, bi people live in rural communities as well as urban communities. Um, sometimes we forget that and we think that everybody wants to escape from rural communities and move to urban communities. And a lot of people love rural communities or smaller cities. And you know, again, you all know that probably better than I do because I've always lived in larger cities, but um, a lot of folks really love being in, in rural places or may not have the opportunity to leave even if they wanted to. So, Last kind of reminder here is, you know, if somebody shares with you that they're lesbian, gay, bi, or trans, it doesn't tell you very much about them. It just tells you that one piece of data. 
it might be a really important piece of data and it might be a really unimportant piece of data depending on why they're you know seeing you why they're there for services so you can assess that as you move along with with a, a client who's lgbt trans joy means being connected to my childhood spirit Thanks, Emil. This is from Ryan Salins, who um, I encourage you to, um, if you like to read, to check out a couple of his books, which are just incredibly beautifully written and um, share a lot about him as well as the world at large. Um, really good author. So let's look at the rates of violence um, within LGBTQ communities. This chart is um, a little complicated, a little bit busy, but it's a combination of, of data from the NISVA survey, which was um, done by the, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And they only broke things down by sexual orientation in terms of our population here. They didn't look at gender identity. So when we look at sexual orientation and the rates of sexual violence, you can see that lesbian and gay folks have um, similar or double the rate than heterosexual folks. So gay men are almost double what heterosexual um, men experience for sexual violence. Um, you can see on the chart that, that bisexual folks are substantially higher, both for bisexual women and bisexual men, than any other category. Um, so it's, again, really important, you know, we, we, when we look at the pie of, like, there's a lot more bisexual people, there's also a lot more health disparities and violence disparities within bisexual communities compared to the other letters of the alphabet. I put the trans piece in pink because I want to remind folks, too, that like you probably know, let, um, trans folks can be lesbian, gay, or bi, um, as well as being trans, because those two things are separate. We know from a couple of different surveys, many different surveys, a growing number of surveys, that around 66% or so of trans folks have experienced sexual violence at some point in their life. So that's a snapshot. When we look at intimate partner violence, we've got a kind of a similar curve when we look at the rates that are happening. Um, you can see that in this one, gay men are not double that of straight folks, um, but are just a little bit less than straight men, just for an example of what might be different here when we look at different populations um, of sexual orientation or gender identity. For trans folks, it's around 50% who have experienced intimate partner violence. And of course, we know that sexual violence and intimate partner violence oftentimes overlap, and um, sometimes it's hard to kind of pick what word we're going to use to describe the victimization or the violence that's happening against folks wanted to remind folks too of when we look at trans folks, um, a lot of times we live in a culture that thinks that um, women are experiencing more violence than men. And we can talk about that because that's true in some respects and it's not true in other respects. But when we look at trans folks, when we've done research and when others have done research, we see that the rates of violence among gender vectors, so folks that are kind of moving in that trans feminine direction or the trans masculine direction. And again, um, there's not a whole lot of space here for non-binary folks, but when we look at those vectors, the rates of violence for childhood sexual abuse, adult sexual assault, intimate partner violence, and stalking are almost identical with folks that are kind of leaning towards masculine or leaning towards feminine. A couple of reminders about hate crimes and um, poly victimization. Um, nine times more lesbian, uh, gay, bisexual, and trans people have, I'm sorry, Lesbian, gay, bisexual, and trans people are nine times more likely to have experienced hate crimes than non-LGBT people. This rate is, um, it's, it's a fixed rate. We, we can look at it as static, but it's not static. Um, these rates are changing um, in ways that we don't really even know where they're gonna go. And we're gonna talk about more, that on, more about that on May 30th. Last slide on data is the rates of poly victimization. So this is a trans-specific slide. Um, it's from some of the research that we did um, 10 years ago. And it's just a reminder to all of us that somebody's walking in your door and they've experienced sexual violence, it is highly, highly, highly likely that they've experienced another form of violence at some point in their life prior to being in your office. And it's highly likely that they will experience something after they leave your office in the next years um, or decades. So just that reminder that people are bringing a lot of stuff um, into the space with you. And that's you know something that I know people know that already, but um, this is just a visual reminder through data. So we can question why their rates are higher for trans and, and queer folks. 
And there's a lot of reasons that we could spend hours and days and months talking about. Um, but being LGBTQ doesn't inherently make somebody more vulnerable or more at risk or more likely to be sexually assaulted. That identity alone is not going to cause more violence. But our social structures, what's going on in the world, some of the, the systems that are creating the disparities basically are, are what's causing the, the challenges. And again, we could talk a lot about that. I just wanna bring up three areas that kind of relate to the why is this happening? Um, and those are related to social determinants of health and minority stress and microaggressions. So this is a really slim down way to talk about some of the things that impact the rates of violence and why it's more difficult for some folks to access care post-assault. Emil, are you willing to read um, the wordy kind of academic microaggressions? <laughs> Absolutely. Microaggressions are brief and commonplace daily verbal, behavioral, or environmental indignities, whether intentional or unintentional, that communicate derogatory or negative slights and insults, or even some hostility toward a group of people. These words and actions establish, reflect, and reinforce the dominant paradigm, erasing the experiences and realities of a minority. Thank you. Um, so that's a mouthful. And um, sometimes it's hard to tell what's a microaggression, what's a mesoaggression, what's a macroaggression. Um, what's a microaggression for some people might be a huge aggression for another. Aggression is kind of the wrong word too. It's not necessarily aggressive. Um, it's really things that eat away at people. And the things that happen every day for trans and queer people can really have a, a hugely detrimental effect on their mental and physical health. A couple of examples, um, trans-specific examples of what microaggressions are. Um, the, this person is standing with a whiteboard that says, wow, I would have never known you used to be a girl. So that's what someone said to this person. Another example is, you know, you're so beautiful for a trans girl. So the slight is in adding that trans piece to this one, for example. So it might be intended as a compliment, but it's not really a compliment. When we look at another concept of minority stress, and all three of these concepts kind of go together in a lot of ways. When we look at minority stress, this is not like the day-to-day -day stress that we experience, you know, from being in a, you know, a traffic jam or, you know, being running late or whatever it is that that we have in our day-to-day -day life. This is like a, a stress with a big capital emboldened S on our chest kind of thing. Um, minority stress is, is something that's caused by external and objective events and conditions. So it's something that's happening on the outside. It's also caused by the expectation of such events happening. So it's kind of like the slide says, anticipatory anxiety. We've had things happen in the past, and so we're anticipating things to happen in the future. It's also caused by the internalization of social attitudes, or societal attitudes, or, or, or cultural attitudes. And it's caused by, the, by navigating pieces of disclosure or non-disclosure around sexual orientation or gender identity. So all of those things of presuming or expecting things to happen that are negative, that relate to somebody's sexual orientation or gender identity, are what somebody is carrying with them through the world. So they're expecting and they're anticipating something to happen. A lot of times it is happening, but the stress is that underlying anticipation of what's gonna happen related to sexual orientation or gender identity. The third piece is looking at social determinants of health. And again, we could spend hours and weeks and months talking about social determinants of health as well. Uh, but social determinants of health are really kind of simple in some ways. Um, they are complex, integrated, and overlapping social structures and economic systems that are responsible for most health inequities. So when we look at this chart, excuse me, we can um, look at a couple of these areas. So we can look at you know, the neighborhood or built environment. So where is somebody living? Um, are they living in areas that are high crime or low crime? Are they living in housing that has safe water or not? Those kinds of things are our neighborhood or built environments. What is somebody's health and healthcare like? Do they have access to healthcare? Are they in a healthy body and a healthy mind? If they're not, can they access services to um, support their health? What is their social and community context? Do they have friends? Are they isolated? Do they have family that they care about and who cares about them? If we look at education, is somebody able to access education? Um, 
K through 12, as well as beyond that? What are some of the variables that might be um, impairing their ability to access education? And what are folks um, like in terms of their economic stability? And you can see how some of those things will go together, right? So if, if somebody is not um, finished high school, if somebody is living in a real poor area, if they have poor health, they're likely going to have very poor economic stability. So all of those pieces go together. And so you might say, like, well, why are we talking about these things that don't feel like they're related? Um, they're definitely related to the work that we all do with sexual violence. Um, a lot of folks that are experiencing some of these things, and just about all queer and trans folks are, um, may not seek uh, care for the or services for what has happened to them because of some of those negative past experiences, because of the situations that they're in. They may have to go to work rather than seeking care, for example, because otherwise they won't have enough money for food. There might be distrust of providers or systems, again, because of those systems that are not really set up for trans and queer people to access. And those systems are often um, set up to not believe um, people. And so trans and queer people oftentimes end up believing that they're not worthy of being treated with respect or care. So let's talk a little bit about ACEs. So ACEs are adverse childhood experiences. And we could talk again for hours or months about this. So adverse childhood experiences are basically this connection between victimization and negative health outcomes. It's a really simple one-to-one -one relationship. Um, you'll see really clearly that the more victimization somebody has, the more negative their health outcomes are across their lifespan. So the CDC looked at these kind of 10 areas of, of dysfunction or abuse. So they looked at physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse. They looked at neglect in terms of physical neglect or emotional neglect. They looked at what was going on in people's households. So was there mental illness in the household? Was somebody in jail or detention at like a parent or a grandparent? Uh, was the mother or anybody else in their house uh, treated violently? Um, were people witnessing violence? Was there substance use or abuse going on in that family? And was there divorce or separation? So those are the factors that they kind of looked at. And they saw that those things, the more of those things people had, the more negative health impacts they had. Okay. I wanted to share with you kind of this layer on of that. So those are 10 things that the CDC looked at. They had thousands and thousands of people that have, have taken this assessment um, to reach these, these results. But we're now looking at where LGBT folks are having additional layers of, of ACEs or adverse childhood experiences. So we know that a lot of LGBTQ folks are experiencing bullying in um, childhood by their peers, by other people in their life. We know that a lot of queer and trans folks are experiencing um, foster care or being forced into a, a mental health uh, institution or mental health services. Um, or are being um, pushed into detention settings. We know that a lot of queer and trans folks are experiencing homophobia, biphobia, or transphobia by their faith leaders or other people um, in authority within their communities. We also know that trans folks and queer folks are being shamed or punished because of their gender expectations or because of their gender presentations. We also know that uh, queer and trans folks are witnessing physical harm against LGBTQ people. And we're certainly seeing that a lot more right now in our culture. And we can talk a little bit more about that today and on May 30th. We also know that trans and queer folks are getting kicked out of their home at younger ages, um, which is, is very difficult and adds to those, those stresses. There can be denial of identity by family or friends or close loved ones. And there can be a lot of misconduct uh, or abuse by law enforcement. Again, you can see how some of those things all go together. If somebody's kicked out of their house, they're more likely to be on the street, more likely to have contact with law enforcement, more likely to be abused by law enforcement. Things like that go together. The other thing that's that's newer and it's kind of coming up in the last couple of years, um, and I would add this to this, to this group of ACEs, is that right now we're living in a world where people are trying to legislate trans and queer people out of existence. Um, so as young people experiencing that and as adults experiencing that, those are really hard things to, to grow up with and live with. So those things are adding to negative health um, impacts in adulthood. So again, I said there's kind of this relationship between the number of ACEs that people experience and the number of, of health uh, ramifications that people have. 
So this is a handy dandy uh, chart that kind of shows the general population of how many folks have one ace. So one ace would be like my um, my dad went to jail. So that would be one ace out of those 10 things that we talked about. And you can see that, you know, 60% or so of, of the general population have at least one ace. 91% of trans folks have one ace. When we look at folks that have four or more aces, so four or more of those bad things that we just listed off, that drops substantially for the general population to 20%. So only 20% of people have had four or more of those negative things happen in childhood. When we look at trans and queer people, that's in the 60s and 70% range, have experienced multiple negative things in childhood. So what that means is that there's a lot of trans and queer adults that are living with depression, living with suicide attempts, living with smoking and alcohol, either addiction or use, having higher rates of HIV or other sexually transmitted infections, are missing work, are likely to have higher cancer rates or bone uh, broken bones or some of the other things that we wouldn't necessarily compare or relate to adverse childhood experiences. So again, this kind of just paints the picture of what people's bodies are coming in with, what their mental health is coming in with when we're looking at what's happening to folks in terms of sexual assault as children or as adults. So um, Emil put into the chat, um, I think, yes, the ACEs webinar. So we did um, a webinar on trans-specific ACEs. So if you want to look at trans-specific ACEs, there's a 90-minute webinar that goes really in depth about some of those very specific things that the CDC didn't look at. And Kaiser has a great um, many, many documents that are linked from this web address. So I encourage you all to, to learn more about ACEs if that is something that is of interest to you. Trans joy is silence. Trans joy is not being seen. Trans joy is under attack. Trans joy is vibrant. Trans joy is exploding light beams. Trans joy is important now and ever. Trans joy is the way we fight back. And that's Kim Baja from Brat Punk Uprising. Thank you. Um, I really, really love this, um, this capture, this quote. Um, we'll share a couple more of them, which I think are, are equally as powerful. So let's look at some LGBTQ tactics. And we are going to do something fun, which will hopefully work. Um, so if you're at a phone or a web browser, um, I would love you to go to the address on the screen, or Emil's going to plop it in the chat. And so we're all going to go. And you can basically, it's a, a chart that you can grab boxes and write in what you think some LGBTQ tactics are that may, may relate to LGBTQ folks and sexual violence or sexual assault. Um, Emil, do you want to share your screen so that we can um, kind of watch that happening, um, which means that yep. I need to unshare mine. There we go. So again, you can, you can get to that link, just grab one of those boxes and write in some of the things that you think are LGBTQ specific things that relate to sexual violence, that are tactics. What might people use as tactics? And to get folks started, let me just pose an idea of like, somebody might threaten to out somebody. Excellent, and that's what somebody was writing too. Excellent. So okay, just drag one of those rectangles, move it on over. Um, we'll just take a couple of minutes here. Yeah, think of some of the tactics that uh, an abuser, a perpetrator, pick the language that you like to use, want to use. Um, what would an offender or perpetrator do that is specific to LGBT folks um, related to sexual assault?
and I'm going to repeat the question just one more time. Um, well, I'll repeat it more than one more time if we need to. But um, so when we think about sexual assault and LGBT people, there might be specific tactics that are used that are involved in that interaction. So a perpetrator may say, I'm going to out you if you don't have sex with me right now, or if you don't have this kind of sex with me, I'm going to do X, Y, or Z to you. That's one example. Why don't we take about another minute to think about what kind of tactics might be used against or towards an LGBT person related to sexual assault? And why don't folks take a couple seconds to finish what you're typing. And then let's just take a quick, quick view of what people have added here. This is fantastic, folks. Emil, since you have the, the biggest screen, are you willing to just go and read through the the circle of, of what yeah. folks have written? And does that show up a bit better for folks? Um, oh, that's great. Great. So we have not being out in specific environments and using that as a means of control, hypersexualizing them based on their identity, fetishizing them, antagonize them based on their sexuality, gender identity telling them to keep silent because they will make the community look bad, using someone's sexual history to justify harming them, um, suggest their identity can be corrected by sex, corrected in quotation marks, um, because of current legislation threatening to have them arrested, kids taken away because of their identity, um, encouraging, oh, I made it so I can't see what's underneath that one, um, encouraging a survivor not to disclose assault as it would, quote, look bad for the community, threats to out, dismiss them, minimizing, could take away their hormones as a way of coercion, questions validity of identity to coerce them, feels dependent on abuser due to no support, isolating to rural areas so they cannot seek services, knowing the individual may not have other support, isolating the survivor, victim blaming based on assumptions of promiscuity, again, isolating um, someone from their community, shaming or questioning their identity, and purposefully misgendering someone or using them as a form of control. That, that is really fantastic, folks. Thank you, Emil, for reading those off. And um, this is a really, really great selection of of answers. Um, and let's swap screens back again. Um, it's all yours. Thank you very much. Um, and so I'm not going to go into a lot more detail about this right now. It, this is something that's it's easier to talk about tactics when we look at um, intimate partner violence and when we look at sexual violence that may be it coming from a lot of different types of interactions. So when sexual violence is not happening within an intimate relationship, it, it's kind of harder to, to pull down some of the specific tactics, but you all did a really fantastic job of, of naming many of those um, things that oftentimes happen. So a couple of resources, um, if you wanna learn more, um, Again, the, the resource that's up on the screen right now is a power and control uh, two-page handout. It's really brief um, for specific to trans folks, and it's IPV related. Um, again, there's there's not a lot that's really specific to sexual violence, at least not that we have found or not that we've created. 
Another uh, resource that folks may be interested, in, which is a little bit related to this, are some of the tactics that are used around stalking. So stalking and sexual violence obviously are, are hand in hand for a lot of um, survivors or victims. Um, we wrote this last year with the Stalking Resource um, Center, which is now not called the Stalking Resource Center, but um, with Spark. So we encourage you to check out both of those resources for additional levels of information. Sorry, sharing links, and I didn't see the screen. <laughs> Sorry. No, <laughs> it's, just quietly. It. it's nice to have a quiet moment. But Dandelion says, trans joy is a participation in the divine act of creation an alchemy of the self, the great unfolding. Trans joy is defiant, invincible, soft, and bleeding. Trans joy is the spiritual connective tissue between me and all my siblings across the world and its centuries. Every breath I breathe in euphoria, I know I do not breathe alone. I use this quote um, at a training that we did last week. And um, I think this is the slide that I asked Emil to read again because I think this quote is just so rich that I'd like us to to absorb this because we so oftentimes hear about what's what's wrong and what's bad in the world and this person captures something that's different and that's magical. Would you be willing to read it again, please? Absolutely. Trans joy is a participation in the divine act of creation, an alchemy of the self, a great unfolding. Trans joy is defiant, invincible, soft, and bleeding. Trans joy is the spiritual connective tissue between me and all my siblings across the world and its centuries. Every breath I breathe in euphoria, I know I do not breathe alone. Thank you. So if you haven't stretched or breathed um, or allowed yourself to just settle into um, the heaviness of what we're doing and that beautiful quote. Um, we're gonna talk about more tough stuff. Um, so I encourage you again, if you need a drink of water, if you need to breathe, if you need to stand up and stretch. Um, I know most people are not on camera, so please do that if you need to do that. Because we're gonna talk about concerns and barriers that folks have. And so we are now gonna try the next experiment of technology, which is to use Poll Everywhere. And the question that we'd like you to answer is, um, what do you think some of the barriers for trans and or LGBT survivors are? So when you think about trans or queer folks accessing services um, or moving about in the world related to victimization, what do you think some of the barriers are? So you can go to the website that Emil has put in there, or you can text on your phone, and we will hopefully end up having answers show up here. And we can sit in relative quiet until we um, are able to let this come on in. So again, think about what do you think some of the barriers are for trans and queer survivors? Excellent. Providers who lack cultural competence for the LGBTQ community. Mm -hmm. Encountering bigoted service providers, yeah. Healthcare and legal systems are not built to accommodate the needs of queer and trans people. Mm -hmm. The idea that having, um, sorry, the idea of having to teach service providers about your identity and how to best serve you is exhausting. Not knowing um, where they will be safe, stigma. Not being listened to, being judged blaming selves or being blamed by others because they should have wanted uh, to have sex with that person because of heteronormativity, yeah. Prejudice from folks who have um, implicit biases, yeah. Lack of acceptance, discrimination, and ignorance about LGBTQ issues, right on. Not feeling relatable. Yeah. You are a small but mighty group. Okay, what else is going on? What else, what else do you have? I said that and it's probably gonna like, you know, it's gonna slow down the, the pace again. Yay. Um, so one size fits all services are based on um, in heterosexual relationships. Yep. One more. 
a society that perpetuates violence against others who don't fit traditions. Yeah, yeah. Those are great answers. You can continue to type it. I'm going to move on, but it'll continue to, to add in that screen so you can all see that if you want to go back to that slide. So let me share with you a couple of um, things that we have found to be true um, as barriers or concerns for folks. Um, safety and fear is one of those things that is just this overarching thing that people feel is afraid or scared or concerned about their safety. Um, that pervasive fear can be um, related to recurring trauma um, and just you know what's happening in their past is bringing forward into their future. It can be about what's going on in terms of harm from providers or harm that's directly happening to them in the world. And it can be about people not knowing where to turn. Those are just you know, a couple of examples where there's safety and fear around accessing services. A lot of times folks have negative experiences. So you all have mentioned some of those ways that negative experiences play out. Um, it can happen through re-victimization. So, you know, there was a negative that somebody experienced something before that was really traumatizing, and they're worried that they're going to experience that same thing again if they go seek services. They um, might have heard negative things from their friends or their family or people in their community. So those other people share their experiences, and then that other person doesn't want to go to those services either. There can be direct uh, prior negative experience with a certain provider. So um, this is especially true in, in communities where there are fewer providers. So if you had a negative experience with you know, the one OBGYN in your community, you may not want to go back to that person. You may not have another option of where else to go. Or there's only one therapist that seems to like work with trans or queer folks, which should never be the case, but sometimes it is. If there's a negative experience, you may not want to go back to that person. Um, and a lot of times what creates those negative experiences are people being asked inappropriate questions or having, you know, that overt level of violence or hostility being expressed to them. And for trans folks in particular, some of those inappropriate questions oftentimes relate to what genitals people have and people feeling that they have the right to ask about um, what genitals somebody has. And I think that um, that's really a uh, an uncomfortable or weird thought for many people that have not thought about what kinds of questions trans people are commonly asked. But trans folks are oftentimes asked, do you have a penis? Do you have a vagina? When have you had the surgery? All of those things that are really none of anybody's business other than maybe your doctor or maybe your sex partner. Another one of the barriers is um, what somebody mentioned in our brainstorm, which was kind of the behavior is not recognized as abuse. So people are not seeing themselves in what they've learned. So we don't have great education in our country about what sexual violence is, what intimate partner violence is. And if you don't fit that gendered binary of women are abused by men, if you don't fit that, you may not see yourself in an abusive situation, whether it's sexual assault or intimate partner violence. And what's happening now in schools is that we're not having a lot of opportunity for kids to see themselves in that educational material. So, you know, schools that are, are taking out um, gay storylines or lesbian storylines in really simple ways of talking about healthy relationships, those kids are not going to see themselves in the healthy relationships that are shared and shown. There can also be cultural myths about who can be assaulted. So again, you know, going to the fact that a lot of times our culture says men can't be assaulted or abused, um, or trans people are all assaulted or abused. There can be lots of cultural myths that perpetuate um, beliefs that are just not true. There can be issues around unwanted disclosure that can be a barrier or concern for trans folks as well as for providers. So people who are seeking care, for example, if they go to an emergency room post-assault, may be immediately outed as, as trans or LGBTQ because if they have to show ID and that ID doesn't match um, what somebody perceives them to be, or if somebody is coming with their partner who is the same sex or the same gender, people may be automatically outed. And that may be a situation that they don't want to be in or that they're worried will have negative consequences on the care that they receive. Um, People may have challenges or concerns about reporting to the police, and there's a lot of things that we can talk about with law enforcement, but the concerns around, around disclosure may be particularly important in decision-making around reporting to police. And just a reminder to all of us that not everybody discloses their gender identity or their sexual orientation, and that is 100% okay. 
when we look at trans people in particular around disclosure, there can be slightly different ramifications around being outed by others or having to come out as trans. Um, and some of those things may be around um, access to children, um, losing access to um, housing or property if that's um, in somebody's realm. Um, it can be, you know, some of those relationship dynamics can be affected when disclosure happens non-consensually. Um, disclosure for trans people can also be um, more of a, a lack of choice. Sorry, that was a that was redundant. Trans people may experience a, a lack of choice in coming out if they seek forensic exams. So if they disrobe, their bodies may tell their trans story for them, um, depending on wh what their body looks like and what our gender beliefs are about bodies. Um, there can be some legal uh, implications around um, people being outed if they're trans, and again, some, some safety concerns. So um, it's true in small cities, if somebody is um, not out as trans prior to this and they disclose, that could cause some, some neighborhood ripples that may be really uncomfortable um, in their world. So we've kind of talked about this a little bit already, like, you know, if you go into the, the ER and you present your ID, and it's seen as incongruent. And incongruent is definitely in big quotes because it's it's this mismatch between what someone's gender identity is and what is seen on paperwork, which may be different than what another person thinks or believes that person's gender identity or their gender is. So it could be that if, you know, if I walk in someplace and I show um, my health insurance card and it says F on it, um, that person behind the counter may look at me and go, this isn't really you. Are you deceiving me? Are you somebody else? Do you have somebody else's insurance card? When it's me, but I'm showing my, my ID and it doesn't match what that person thinks it's supposed to. So sometimes that's used to deny people services um, if people are thinking that they're being deceived or the truth isn't being told. And trans people just might be fearful of being outed by that process and not wanna deal with that um, potential hassle. Reminder that a lot of folks don't wanna change their name at all or their gender at all. And if they do, that cost might be a barrier to, to making those changes. So there might be a, lots of good reasons, um, all reasons are good reasons, that somebody may not have changed their ID if they wanted to. So we've talked about this already in some different ways about women-focused systems. So again, there can be this belief set that the only people that are victims are women, the only people that are perpetrators are men. Where does that leave anybody that's not a woman or a man? Um, so it really erases trans survivors um, of any gender vector. Um, and it puts lesbian, gay, and bi folks in a really um, interesting spot when there's um, male and male sexual assault or female and female sexual assault. Where does that fit into people's presumption of what sexual assault looks like? And the end result of that oftentimes is people will say, well, am I really a survivor? And, you know, I don't, I don't relate to what's being talked about in the media or what I learned at school. So therefore I'm not a survivor and I'm not gonna go seek care. So people live with that trauma without getting the services that they, they need and deserve. So I mentioned law enforcement before, and, and I know that most of us who work with uh, survivors uh, have probably complicated relationships with law enforcement. And um, it is what it is. And it's not saying that cops are bad and it's not saying that all cops are bad but there's been a lot of historic uh, trauma for lesbian, gay, and bi, and trans folks with law enforcement. And there's certainly a lot of things that are happening in our current world that make trust of law enforcement very difficult for, for some populations, um, especially those folks who are black or brown, as well as LGB or T. Um, we talked a little bit about before about the concerns about being outed in the criminal justice system, as well as just the, the violence and re-victimization that oftentimes happens with law enforcement. Neil, are you willing to read this quote about police misconduct? Yeah. They referred to me as female at first, but after they checked my ID, they referred to me as a male. They treated me as a prostitute and told me to leave or else I'd be arrested. Thank you. So this is just another example of where um, systems are really failing people, where systems are not seeing as people. Um, they're presuming that someone is something that they're not. And for a lot of trans folks, it's the walking while trans piece of data where people think that somebody is a sex worker when they're not, they're just walking about the world. But that label gets put on them and then care does not get carried out for that person. 
Um, I think this is the, the one of the last barriers that we'll talk about today, and that's around um, culturally aware providers. So many of you mentioned that in our brainstorm. So a lot of times people just don't have training. They don't have enough training or they don't have any training at all. And I always want to believe that people are good intentioned, but they just don't have the knowledge that they need. And that lack of knowledge can lead to intrusive questions. It can lead to outing survivors without their consent. Um, it can lead to a lot of things that are not so great for folks, um, including unequal services or overt discrimination. And someone mentioned explicit or implicit bias before. So that oftentimes stems from not being aware of what's going on for LGBTQ people. And all of those things I always want to believe are unintentional, that, that somebody's not trying to be uneducated, not trying to be mean, not trying to be insensitive, but they just don't know better. And so it's our collective job to help folks know a little bit better and do a little bit better. So a couple of uh, resources. One is a self-assessment tool that um, we created a few years ago and it's been updated. So if folks want to think about, well, what is your agency's level of cultural awareness and you know how are we doing around queer and trans folks i encourage you to have like everybody in your office take the assessment compare your answers look at what's the same what's different why it's different why it's the same where you may want to make some changes or where you're doing really well um, i think it's an interesting tool it's really long so it may take folks a while and it really takes some commitment to um, this process to to do it well Chris says, to me, trans joy means embracing every iteration of myself and telling the world who I am rather than letting the world tell me. Thanks. And I'm sorry if folks are hearing my dog who's decided to go kind of batshit crazy. So um, I'm sorry if you are hearing the barking. Let's look at just a couple of things that are rural specific. Um, and again, those of you who are in rural communities or in a state that has a lot of rural areas, are going to know this better than than I do, but just some reminders that LGBTQ communities in general, big in big cities or in smaller cities, are very tight knit, and so it sometimes is even more tight knit, if you will, in smaller communities um, where everybody knows everybody. Um, a lot of times, people are concerned about not causing waves, not um, tarnishing people's reputations as a community. So people may not disclose their survivorship or their, their victimization because they don't want queer and trans people to look bad, big, big quotes again. And they may be concerned that people um, will think bad things about them if they come out as queer or trans. So like either the victimization piece or the trans or queer piece may be concerns for if they come out or disclose that information. We know that in smaller communities, the support services may be a little bit different. There might be fewer places to seek support. Um, some of those places may have multiple things going on in that, that agency. So they may not just look at sexual assault, but they may have multiple other forms of, of services offered at that location. So it may not be as specific or as knowledge-based in that specific area that a survivor might need. There might be concerns about confidentiality. And again, this is a, an assuming good intentions here, but confidentiality can be really hard and tricky and people may be concerned about um, disclosing that they're trans or queer or disclosing their survivorship when they're living in a community where they see somebody at the grocery store and they may not want people to know that piece of information about them. And again, you know, the, the aspect of the, the dual roles of, you know, who are people in community with, um, how do they interact in those small communities? And what do we do when everybody knows everybody's business? And do we trust that the confidentiality will stay where it's supposed to? And just a reminder too about, about isolation. Um, in smaller communities, it might be easier for a perpetrator, um, especially with an intimate partner violence um, situation, to keep folks away from other people. Um, there's less of an opportunity for folks to get social interaction um, if they're in a smaller community or if they're in a community where everybody knows where they're possibly going throughout the world. Um, so those are just a couple of things to, to keep in mind around isolation. Let's talk a little bit about the socio-political culture. We're just gonna talk a little bit about it. Um, we could look at things like these triple threats that are going on right now, and we can look at the anti-trans or the anti-queer. Most of the things that are going on right now are anti-trans, a um, little bit less about anti-LGBT. 
look at reproductive rights, which affects all of this, and gun violence, which affects all of this. All of these things go together, and they're all really, really um, prevalent right now in our, our current discourse. So I know some of you might be thinking, why should we be talking about like all the stuff that's going on in culture? How does it relate to sexual violence? Why should this matter? Not to Harbor House, but to you all. Um, and so I just want to remind folks that these issues are really, really, really intersectional. Um, these inter they intersect with sexual violence, they intersect with intimate partner violence, they all go together. Um, there can be threats that limit access to people's health care um, if they need health care, um, post-assault, 10 years post-assault, pre-assault, anytime. Um, there can be overt threats to people's um, personal safety or to their systemic safety. So in their neighborhoods, to their personal body, to their family's body, to their provider's um, health and well-being. And right now we're seeing a lot of people who are very emboldened to act violently. We're seeing people, you know, the wave of people get really excited by other people who are acting badly and other people are kind of going along for that ride and acting um, very poorly and violently as well. So just a, this is kind of the teaser of what's gonna come later um, in a couple of weeks, but just a reminder of kind of what state sanctioned hate is or what state sanctioned violence is. Um, we're describing it as behaviors, hate-driven behaviors, bias, or crimes that are perpetuated by legislation, political or cultural movements, law enforcement, or media. We're looking at state-sanctioned hate that is systemic and institu institutionalized harm based on a foundation of hate intended to erase or degrade a group of people with a shared identity or experience. So again, that's the teaser. We're gonna talk a lot, lot, lot more about that in a couple of weeks, but I wanna just do a quick kind of poll here about where you have seen this kind of stuff in your community. So the stuff is political things, um, bands, sports, things that are, are happening in your community. So again, we'll look at this through poll everywhere, computer access or phone access, and you should be able to just click on the little icon with a little word next to it um, and be able to say what's happening in your community. Yeah, are you seeing things on social media? Is there a bathroom ban? Is there a sports issue around? Can trans girls play sports? I'm gonna shut my door while y'all are. So think about your community and your community can be your whole state, could be the, the city that you live in. Think about if you've seen um, access being denied for trans youth, um, or if you've seen people not being able to access reproductive health care. Have you seen any political ads that mention trans or queer people in them? It's only letting people pick one. Mm. Okay, this was a fail then. I failed, you all win, you did it right. I don't, it didn't tell me that you couldn't pick more than one. It said multiple choice, like it didn't say radio button. Okay, so this is a teaser. We're gonna do this better when we do it again in, in a couple of weeks. Um, but these are some of the areas that we're gonna talk about um, in a couple of weeks on May 30th. We're gonna talk about social media, healthcare access, threats to providers. Providers are getting threatened um, to have their licenses taken away or physical threats to them. Parents of, of trans and queer kids are being threatened with um, CPS and child abuse claims. We're gonna talk about transition or detransition bans. Yes. We're gonna talk about what's happening at schools and banning of books and educational content. We're gonna look at some of the older things which are like bathroom bans and some of the challenges that, that folks have. We're gonna look at sports and who can play sports on which teams. We're gonna talk about what's happening in workplaces related to anti-trans or anti-queer issues. 
how much money politicians are spending on anti-queer, anti-trans legislative efforts um, to get reelected and, and carry out some of the, the bills that are really harmful. We're gonna look a little bit at politicians behaving badly in addition to spending money. And we're gonna look at drag events, which a lot of folks have been hearing about. Um, so come back in a couple of weeks and we'll talk more about it. Um, I just wanted to add this really fantastic photo of Lizzo, who uh, was in Tennessee performing the other day, uh, uh, sometime in, in April, and um, invited a whole bunch of drag queens to come up and perform with her. And, you know, potentially all of them could have been arrested because of what Tennessee's laws are right now. But, you know, Lizzo was doing this really proactive, positive thing and kind of thumbing her nose at the legislative efforts in, her, in this state. So um, there's a way that we can all use our power or our, our political effort or something to make a really good difference in, in people's lives. All right, let's look at what folks can do. And we're gonna talk about what people can do in workshop two, three, and four as well. But these are kind of the general things. What can you do as victim service providers, as advocates, to make life better for trans and queer folks. So again, pull everywhere. Um, hopefully this will let you respond as many times as you want. Um, so what are some concrete things that you can do to reduce barriers for LGBTQ survivors? It's the same way as last time. So what are some concrete things that you can do to reduce barriers for trans folks, for queer folks? Partner meaningfully with your local LGBTQ org, yes. Become informed about issues, yes. Spread awareness. Hmm? Become more educated. Hire more queer staff. Be open-minded. Uh, signage and offices indicating that you're an ally, um, examples of displaying a, a pride flag. Mm -hmm. Be culturally responsive. Advocate uh, within my org to train everyone on barriers trans and queer people are facing. Ask questions and be willing to learn. Excellent. Brainstorming ways to tear down barriers for trans survivors uh, to have sexual assault kits. Mm -hmm. Legislative and political advocacy uh, fighting LGBTQ bias. Yep, pronouns everywhere, forms, email, and outreach. Yep, um, outreach and education in the community. Yeah. Asking what someone needs and not assuming. Yeah. What else? This is a fantastic list. Spreading and sharing trans joy. Thank you. Yes. Let's, I'm going to move on from that one. That was a, that was a great one to, for us to kind of pull it off to. If you want to keep on adding more, add more. Um, I can share out the answers that you all shared um, after this, this time today. So first reminder is that you know how to do your job. Um, hopefully you know how to do your job. Um, so do what you already know how to do. Um, if you stay focused on the skills that you already have, you're just applying it to different populations, different people. Obviously, more knowledge is really good, but do your job the way you know how to do your job and stay focused. Um, someone said pronouns everywhere, right? Pronouns everywhere. We want to um, share our pronouns. So what we did at the very beginning, we want to, you know, say, hey, my name is Michael. I use here them, you know, they pronouns. And we can state that, you know, right up in front. So when we are introduced back, when that's bad language, I'm sorry. When somebody says, you know, their, what their name and pronouns are, we've already invited them to do so. So we can share, we can ask, and then we can consistently use their pronouns. And again, having things on intake forms is great. Having name badges with pronouns is great. Anywhere and everywhere that can be is fantastic. Um, I wanna share, this is, this is totally not related to sexual assault, but this is a great video that just kind of reminds us of like what the importance is of using people's name and pronouns.
Jeg med med dig. And what's your name? It's James. James? So not a Starbucks promotion, but sweet and nice. And the smile at the end is really like, it captures how important that is. Um, and it's really amazing how many companies are, are paying attention to our current world and doing things that are really positive and affirming. So um, keep an eye out for those, those wonderful ads like that. So another thing that we can do is um, kind of like knowing how to do your job and doing your job is to really stay focused on the person that's in front of you or the issue that's going on. So we want to stay person and issue centered, um, not identity centered, not um, something that we have in our head or an assumption that we have. Um, for folks that um, are able to, we want to think about what the non-discrimination provisions are within VAWA. Um, almost all sexual assault agencies are funded in some way through VAWA streams, so Department of Justice, um, or through FIPSA under HHS. So kind of knowing what those rules and requirements are, we'll talk more about that in workshops two and three, um, are really important to making sure that people have equal access to services. In our world right now, it's really important if we can report hate speech. So if you see hate speech on social media, whether it's on your, your workplace or your personal, not telling you what to do in your personal life, um, but it's really important to, you know, to say to folks, hey, this is not okay, um, what was just posted here, or to report people as a violation of terms of service. And it's always really good to post positive things um, to kind of change that balance of what's getting posted on social media. We can always um, use our social media to do things like put positive, affirming messages out that say, we serve trans and queer survivors. We know that trans and queer survivors um, deserve to be served. We know that trans and queer survivors are fill in the blank. Um, there's a lot of things that you can copy and borrow and share and forward from other organizations. So this is from NNEDV, so like, you know, big national organization. So you can find stuff all the time. And I encourage folks to just put things out there in your regular social media feed, whether it's once a month or once a week, that just reminds folks that you are an okay agency for people who are trans and queer to come to. Um, and I know people sometimes say that I, I'm soft about these things, but our body language is really, really important when we're working with trans and queer folks. Body language is important working with any survivor or, or interacting with anybody, but are we able to lean in, physically lean in to people? Um, not, in a, not in an encroaching way on people's space, but are we able to have an open body language where our legs and our arms are not crossed, where we're willing to um, reach out and fist bump somebody if that's a form of touch that feels good to them? A lot of times trans and queer people are, are really not touched enough, not looked at enough by eye to eye, and not treated well in terms of like how people are interacting with them through our bodily um, engagement. And that goes true for listening as well. So sometimes listening might be listening more or longer for some trans and queer folks who may not be able to trust as quickly or as easily as other folks. Sometimes we need to listen to stories that we might feel are unrelated to the services that they're there for. Sometimes we may need to listen over and over and over again until someone feels enough trust in us to be able to share what they need to share or more of what they need to share. Um, another way that we can um, make a difference is to show up and um, hopefully organizations, and we're seeing more and more organizations um, allowing their staff to have time off to go to protests or rallies if that's 
that's their jam, or to write letters to legislators, or to show up in other ways that support queer and trans folks. So I encourage people to show up in whatever way you can as an organization. Um, or as individuals, if that so moves you. So it can be your body, it can be speaking up, it can be writing, it can be any way that you can um, elevate and, and be aware of the issues and share that with other people. Someone mentioned in one of our brainstorms about um, continuing to learn and um, we certainly continue, <laughs> encourage people to continue to learn with whatever it is that you need to learn more about. Um, I know that, you know, I always need to learn more about some really esoteric things or some really basic things. Like, I don't know very much about immigration and I really need to know more. So that might be my thing to continue learning on. And for you, it might be about bisexual people and why do bisexual folks have higher rates of victimization? So whatever it is, um, we encourage you to keep on learning and you'll have three other opportunities to learn in this series, for example, and um, many other resources that you can get connected to. And I wanted to share this this last kind of what you can do, which is not really what you can do, but um, I can't remember when we posted this, but it was right after something really horrible happened in the world. And we posted this on social media. Now it feels like something horrible is happening in the world all the time. Um, but we reminded folks to, to love on your people and maybe even more importantly, to love on the people who aren't yet your people. So again, I know that love is a, a touchy word for some folks, but you know, think about how you can share that love or that kindness or that care with people. And it may not be about what you're doing for providing services. It might not be about the nuts and bolts, but it might be about how you can connect heart to heart with somebody and how you can literally see someone for their humanity. So those are a few really broad things about what you can do to reduce barriers and how to improve services for queer and trans folks. You can connect with us in a couple of ways, and I know we only have four minutes left, but um, our website has lots of resources that you can check out if you want to, and our social media where we post daily, if not multiple times a day, and um, there's lots of fun, interesting things. So we, we like to be friends with folks, and um, we will try to friend you back or like you back um, if you want to connect with us. So you all probably already know this, but the next three events are um, one every week. So next week is Getting Real, Building Practical Skills and Solutions from LGBTQ Case Scenarios. So we'll have a couple of examples that we can really dive deeply into. The week of the 24th is Supporting Trans and LGBTQ Survivors Through Forensic and Medical Exams. And then the last one is what I've mentioned a couple times today, which is looking at identity-based hate violence and how legislative and cultural hate-fueled violence intersects with sexual assault. So I know we don't have a whole lot of time, and I know that I've talked really fast today um, and probably not always clearly as, as I could or should. Um, this is my dog who's barking. Um, so this is Garland, and Garland wants to know if you have questions or comments, um, and we can we can take as long as, as folks need to And I'm going to pop my info up and Emil will put it in the chat as well. And I'm going to unshare so we can um, see each other if we would like uh, to look at each other. Comments or questions or things that um, you're thinking about before we leave. I'm seeing quiet. I'm hearing quiet. Um, you know, one thing, thank you, Michael, for, for everything that you shared over the last hour and a half. Um, one thing that just stuck stuck out to me, because I don't think I've actually heard it said in a training specifically about working with queer folks, um, your point about body language and about like literally what am I doing with my body what am I doing with my face like that's the thing we talk about in terms of advocacy and counseling and working with like all survivors but it does need to be said specifically when we have a queer person in front of us right that um anybody we can all sense when somebody is not comfortable being in mm -hmm. front of us right and so um I just appreciate that you said that and highlighted that specifically for this community Right. Thank you. Yeah, and that's, you know, one of the, the places where it typically comes out is like if somebody says, oh, my partner, he, and you thought the person was straight, and they've just, you know, it's like, well, what is that? What does the advocate do? You know, do they literally push back? And it might be really, really subtle. It might be just looking away. So like that body language is so critical. And, and that person's going to know, they're going to know in an instant. And that makes that interaction less safe and less comfortable. So 
yeah, it can happen at any point in time, but yeah, it's, it's important for us to think about. Thanks. Other thoughts or comments? I also just wanted to say thank you so much for incorporating the quotes of trans joy throughout the presentation. Like it really was just like a nice, I don't know, it, it brought a smile to my face reading the quotes. Um, so I really appreciated that. And it also just made me think about, again, how can we incorporate more like stories or personal stories within the work that we do? Because um, I feel like it just brings... I don't know, it reminds people of like the human, like in all of us. Um, so yes, yeah, so I wanted to say thank you for that. I also wanted to share too, because I know I've I've heard before in like different settings, like, oh, you know, like Connecticut's a pretty accepting state, like there's not much to worry about here. And I just wanted to drop in an article. Um, and from like, I guess it's like two months ago. I th believe this was like last year, there were some high school students that were trying to challenge the trans inclusive sports policy that we have here in Connecticut. Um, turns out they're still pushing it. They're still trying to appeal it. Um, so, you know, this is still happening. This is still impacting, um, you know, not only LGBTQ like survivors, but folks and um, youth as well. So, you know, th this is why, like, we're here and we're talking about it. It's, it is happening here in Connecticut. It's not, you know, everywhere else. It's, it's happening here in our home. So just wanted to share. Thank you very much. And yeah, it is happening. It's unfortunate that it's happening everywhere. And I know we're one minute after. Thank you um, all for being here. And, and thank you, Kelsey and Amanda and, and Bridget, who's somewhere. Um, and Emil, thank you for um, being last minute draw into this. So, um, and I really appreciate everybody being here and I'm hoping to see everybody in next week and the week after and the week after. Cool. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank um, I will just gentle reminder, if you did your, your assessment at the beginning, but maybe didn't like finish it or click submit, just go check back on that and make sure that you sent it in if you did it so that we can have everybody's responses. I'll send out a follow-up email with all of the many wonderful links that Emil was putting in the chat today. Um, and I, Amanda, am I forgetting anything? Um, and just that the next, uh, so this is a training series of a total of four trainings, but the next two are specific to the member centers and the victim advocates that work um, in our coalition, but the last training is open to the public. So um, definitely sign up for those for the ones that apply to you or sign up for all of them if you can <laughs> we'll be here so thanks everyone thank